good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Allow me to extend a very warm well welcome to all of you who are joining us today. And we are very delighted to have so many of you across many time zones and actually across continents. Dzień dobry, dobry wieczór, witamy Państwa bardzo serdecznie. I also want to welcome Professor Robert Frost. We are delighted and truly grateful and honored to have Professor Frost accept our invitation to speak today. My name is Elizabeth Zehenter, and I am the president of Yegmanian Law Society and also board member of the Kościuszko Foundation Philadelphia chapter, and I will be your moderator today. I am very delighted to introduce you to our second webinar in our series, which we called Ethnic Minorities in Polish Lands. The idea came to us uh, last year and we began the series and uh, we have a long list of organizations who are co-sponsoring this with us and I'll talk about them in a second. But last year uh, we started a series of lectures dealing with what we called ethnic minorities, various groups that have lived in the territory of Polish lands over the Polish history, being ethnic, national, religious or cultural uh, minorities and groups. And it stems from the fact that we all as human beings, as citizens, and particularly also as lawyers, we all have interest and a responsibility really to promote the justice, fairness, rule of law, to defend liberty, to make sure that justice is given to all, especially those who cannot fight for it. And as lawyers, we are particularly interested in Polish legal thoughts throughout history, how Polish law has dealt with complexity of Polish geographic and historical situation, how Polish uh, governance, a system of governance and laws worked, what did work, what didn't. And we wanted to showcase this complexity and the nuances of the Polish history and the co complexities of responding of, of Polish, Polish legal theory. Now, Poland has been diverse from the very early times and Polish legal thought has developed to actually deal with that diversity. Um, there were attacks coming in from the West and we had a Teutonic Knights coming from Northwest. Several Islamic tribes have been exterminated and Poland tried, Poland tried to deal with this um, and uh, tried to defend them, uh, the Polish tribes, Polish kingdom, various tribes tried to defend themselves by developing a theory of just war, developing a very advanced theory actually of international relationships and theory of individual freedom and conscience and theory of human dignity, which is actually very, very interesting because this is the theory that we are using right now in most of the human rights instruments in the UN system, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So just to name a few, we had several of those scholars, Paweł Włodkowicz, Stanisław Skarbomierz, Andrzej Laskar, there were many. And Poland was at the time reasonably um, tolerant or to tolerance or toleration, I'm not sure which word to use, but both probably apply. And Poland, for example, Poland defended Jan Hus, who was a Protestant at the Sobor of Constance. And finally, when we talk about Polish uh, history, um, one document that I want to mention is the 1573 Warsaw Compact or Warsaw Confederation, which is the first kind of grant of religious freedom or toleration to free citizens. And while we can debate the extent of it, to whom it applied, was it true tolerance or true toleration or the mixture? Nonetheless, if you look at it in the context of remaining religious wars in other parts of Europe at the time, the witch burning and, and several other things, it is a fairly remarkable document because it did you know, influence later on, this is what we're gonna hear, uh, the, the Union, Polish-Lithuanian Union and how it was governed. And Professor Norman Davis uh, actually feels that this is one of those remarkable documents worth mentioning. All right, so that's why we created this, you know, this series, and this is our second lecture in the series. Um, things like that don't happen, of course, without many people participating. So let me thank those who have uh, made it possible. First of all, let me thank Kościuszko, Fiat, uh, Kościuszko Foundation, especially Philadelphia chapter, my chapter, and the main uh, offices of Kościuszko Foundation, including Marek Skutek, Basia Bernhard and Eva Zadvorna for their help. I want to thank many universities, among them University of Pennsylvania, University of Massachusetts Law School, Emory University College of Arts and Sciences, Deans of the Jagiellonian University, University of Łódź and UCL, all of whom actually helped to advertise our event. I also want to thank our faculty emeriti, 
we have a previous faculty who spoke to us. They also advertised it to their students, so Professor Maya Jekan and Dr. Maria Kobielska. And also, I want to thank our upcoming faculty, of whom I will speak shortly, Professor Eugenia Janiec Prokop, who also advertised our event and got the permission of the deans to advertise it at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow in Poland. Finally, I also want to thank various legal affinity organizations, which also advertise it to their members. And finally, last but not least, I want to thank the law firm of Cohen Seglias for allowing to lose their Zoom and Olivia for her expertise because she made lots of this happen. So now let me introduce to you the man for whom, for whom you came here and why you're here, Professor Robert Frost. Now he is a truly distinguished speaker who should not need any introduction. He's so well published and so well known, but I will mention a few words so that um, we are all on the same page. Professor Frost is currently Bernard Fletcher Chair of History at the University of Amberdeen in UK. He is a distinguished scholar of Polish Lithuanian Union, of the welfare of that period, and also of the whole idea of union as a governance a system. He is also chair and the director of the new Center for the Polish Lithuanian Studies, which opened just in January last year in 2020, and it was opened by the Polish and Lithuanian ambassadors. So that's a wonderful thing. Professor Frost, uh, academic history, he first attended the University of St. Andrews, where he studied modern history, and he also attended Jagiellonian University in Kraków, where he received the diploma in Polish language and Polish culture. He wrote his doctoral thesis in the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University of London, which is now UCL, and he was studying there under Professor Norman Davis, another famous historian of Polish uh, history. Thereafter, after receiving his doctorate, Professor Frost taught at King's College, and ultimately he returned to Scotland when he accepted the position of the Chair of History, which he now occupies. Um, Professor Frost is a member of many prestigious associations. For example, he is a foreign member of the Polish Academy of Arts and Sciences, Polska Academia Umiejętności, but he is also a fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He is author of many books and many papers. And by the way, all of those will be listed on our website. If you go to the Agenda and Law Society website, you will find all those. But just to mention, the last one is his um, three volume, History of Poland, Lithuania, published by Oxford University Press. The first volume is out. It was published uh, originally in English, of course, in 2015, and su subsequently it has been translated and is available in Polish. The second volume is forthcoming, and I understand that our the talk today will be based on the materials from that second volume, and thereafter there will be third. Now, the history of Poland and Lithuania won many accolades. Among them, just to mention a few, is the Pro Historia Polonorum Prize, Nagroda Benedicta Polaka, not to mention the prize of the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In addition, Professor Frost is also recognized for his merits to Lithuania and in, for example, in 2020, he received the Knight's Cross for his merits to Lithuania. Um, so, you know, we are delighted. It truly, we couldn't have a more distinguished scholar. We truly honored to have him today. Two more words about logistics. Um, the event today will consist of two parts. First, there will be a lecture by Professor Frost and thereafter Q&A. I already received several questions. I am asking you that if you have other questions, please send them to, to me via Q&A because the meeting is being recorded and for privacy reasons, we are asking that you direct all the questions to me. I will combine the questions and make sure that the, the, the repeat, repetitive questions are not being asked. In addition, as I said, you can go to our page and you can find more information from the previous lectures and this one, and this one will be posted here and also at the Kościuszko Foundation website, the lecture once it's done and edited. Finally, for those of you who are lawyers, we are um, so-called continuous education, uh, legal education provider, and we are offering 0.5 hours credit for substantive part and 0.5 hour credits for ethics. So if you are interested in receiving those credits, please write, write to us at the Jagiellonian Law Society at Gmail to get the credits. Final announcement, our future lecture is set for May 11th. 
Uh, as you know, we are talking about different minorities in Polish lands. Today, we will talk about how the diversity and complexity and many minorities were managed during the period of Lithuanian Union. But the next few lectures will deal with various minorities like Lemkos, Boykos, Kashubians, Armenians. But on May 11th, we have another very distinguished speaker, Professor Eugenia Janiec Prokop from the Jagiellonian University. And she will speak to us about the largest minority and the longest living minority in Polish lands, the Polish Jews. So please um, mark this date in your calendar. And with all that, Robert, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for that extremely generous uh, introduction. I've been sitting here trying not to blush on camera. So perhaps at this lecture, which will actually touch in part on the diversity of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, but I thought that I ought to talk about law since I am addressing a distinguished audience in part of lawyers. And I hope that my take on the law of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth um, will be convincing. As Elizabeth said, my history of the Polish-Lithuanian Union is now going to come out in three, not two volumes. The second volume, which I hope to finish this summer, will be entitled The Making of the Polish-Lithuanian Republic. Its central argument is simple. It is that the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a republic and that this mattered. Polish historians tend to argue that a republic is just another form of the state and they treat the union as a state and in many respects as a failed state. Yet I argue that the republic was a republic not a state, it was a community of citizens. The Union of Lublin is quite clear on this. It forms one republic out of two states and two nations. Today, addressing a distinguished audience of lawyers who serve another republican system of justice, I thought I would think a little about the consequences of that argument for the law. For the law was essential to the functioning of that republic and was seen as essential to its citizens. Lex est rex, the law is the king, was a phrase frequently used in treatises, in parliamentary debates, by the Schlachter. They were proud of the fact that they were governed under the law and that the king and that the institutions of the republic had to take account of what the law was. And I begin with this image of the presentation by Jan Waski of his statute to King Alexander in 1506. This was a digest of Polish law, not a codification of Polish law, but this illustration indicates that law was important, that it was vital. And yet one of the central contentions about the failure of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is that it failed to live up to this exaggerated respect for the law, that in practice the Schlachter disregarded the law and treated it lightly, and this is what brought the Republic to the anarchy that was so criticised by the great paladins of enlightenment across Europe, from Voltaire to Adam Smith and David Hume. This was certainly the view of this man, Władysław Wojcicki, secretary of the Ossolineum Library in Lvov before the First World War, and a journalist and historian. Wojcicki did copious research in the court books of the Ruthenian Palatinate in the late 16th and early 17th century, and he was shocked by what he found. And I'm going to quote the famous quote that historians of Poland know well, co za świat, co za świat, and this is my translation. What a world, what a world, menacing, wild, murderous, a world of oppression and violence, a world without authority, without government, without order, and without compassion. Blood was cheaper than wine, a human being cheaper than a horse. Whomsoever the Tatar did not kill, the ruffian killed. Whomsoever the ruffian did not kill, his neighbour killed. A world in which it was hard to be virtuous, to keep the peace impossible. The quote comes from the two-volume work, Pravem i Levem. A nice pun in the title there. And the contention was clear that the Schlachter, while they trumpeted the importance of the law, they lived without taking account of that law. His charge sheet was long. 
there was a prevalence of violence in this Schlachter society with wounding and murder and rape common. There was a lack of respect for the law, as was demonstrated by these frequent crimes. There were increasingly harsh penalties for crime that were introduced, but that merely indicated that the system of justice was ineffectual in pursuing crime. There was a failure of the system to enforce the law. The second volume of Pravem i Levem is entitled Voine Privatne, Private Wars, in which noblemen, heedless of the law, conducted their own private wars with private armies beyond the reach of the state. The second volume spends much time on this, the dispute between Stanislav Diabel Stadnitsky, Stanislav Stadnitsky, the devil of Weinsut, who terrorized his neighbors and who mounted frequent raids on their property, who committed woundings, murders, and other crimes, until he came up against this man, Wukash Opolinsky, the elder. This is him when he'd risen to the position of crown marshal towards the end of his life, but he was a young man when, as a neighbor of Stadnitsky, he came into conflict with Stadnitsky, and Stadnitsky and Opolinsky conducted a private war in Wojinsky's terms, in which Stadnitsky was killed. I shall talk more about this case later in the lecture, but first let's have a look at these claims of Wojinsky. It is certainly true that contemporaries had a similar perception in many respects. This is Krzysztof Opolinsky, Palatine Voyevoda of Poznan in the mid-17th century. When he was not appointed Chancellor by the King, as he expected, he withdrew in high dudgeon to his estates and wrote a series of satires attacking noble society and its values. In his second satire, Who is a Truly Free Nobleman?, he claimed that the Commonwealth was not living in a golden age, a silver age, or even an age of lead. It was living in an age of clay. And this is what he asked. How can you be called free when your countless crimes render you a nefarious bondsman? How can you be a true nobleman in such heavy chains? A good noble, you say. Really? Do true nobles steal and ravage? In his seventh satire, he said that honesty is rarer than albino crows and ravens, and he argued that judges lacked a good conscience and a knowledge of the law. The tribunals of Lithuania and Poland that were set up in 1578 and 1581 respectively were formed by elected judges who were ordinary noblemen for the most part. They were not trained in the law. Noblemen did not enter professions and therefore, Opolinsky maintained, they did not have good knowledge of the law. Talking of the Crown Tribunal, he asked, why should young ignorant judges learn their trade on me? He claimed that elected judges were tools of faction and were not objective in reaching their judgments, a claim that has often been echoed by historians. He condemned the litigiousness of Schlachter society, which, he suggested, bred hatred, jealousy and strife. The failings of the legal system were also confronted by Wukash Gurnitsky, a regalist who felt that royal power should be strengthened. In his Rozmowa Polaka z Włochem, his conversation of a Pole with an Italian concerning Polish liberties and laws, published around 1616, the Pole claimed that a Pole lives in freedom, that is, to live as he wishes and to do what he pleases. The Italian, and the Italian is echoing Gurnitsky's own opinion, replied, he who lives as he wishes lives honestly, and yet here around Warsaw it is not like this, for everywhere is plagued by diverse crimes, shootings, killings, rapes, looting, and so on, and every hour there are more. Thus it does seem to me that this is liberty. The Italian explains this state of affairs thus. For you have tied the hands of your king, who cannot defend you from your domestic enemies. In other countries peace reigns everywhere, so that liberty can stand on its own two feet. In these lands the suzerain, Pan Zwierzchny, ensures that everyone is secure in his own home and fears nobody. If anyone should breach the public peace, he deals with it in his official capacity and dispenses punishment. And here we get to the crucial phrase. Here the victim must right wrongs himself. Nowadays the king can do nothing. It is the republic that is responsible for maintenance of the public peace. And I would ask you to remember that phrase, for I believe it is important. Justitiam non rex, sed respublica dispensat. Justice is dispensed not by the king, but by the republic. And this is the theme that I wish to explore in the rest of this lecture.
Let's remind ourselves of the ways in which, so it is claimed, judicial authority was taken from the king. In 1425, the statute of Neminem Captivabimus Nisi Jure Victum was passed. This was a version of habeas corpus, but it was stronger than habeas corpus because a criminal could not be arrested until a verdict had been passed in court. He could not be arrested pending trial. He could only be arrested after he was found guilty. And in consequence, many who felt that they might be found guilty simply absconded. In 1454, the Nyeshava privileges established the Samiks as the foundation of the political system. The king could not call out the pospolite Rushenia and introduce new taxes without summoning the Samiks. In 1505, the Statute of Nihil Novi decreed that the king could make no new law without the consent of the same. In 1518, the king ended the practice of hearing appeals from dependent subjects of nobles in his Aulic court, and I use the term subjects, poddani, deliberately, rather than serfs or peasants. In the 1530s, same statutes began to be printed in Polish, and there was an excellent knowledge of the law among Poles, among the Szlachta, in consequence, they quoted statutes in their Samiks, they quoted statutes in the same to back up their argument. In 1578, the Crown Tribunal was established, and in 1581, its Lithuanian counterpart. These are frequently presented as the ultimate courts of appeal for cases in the local Schlachta courts. And in the 16th century, it became the norm that judicial starostas held their offices for life. The judicial starostas were in origin, the king's officers in the district. They were responsible for enforcing the law. But if they held their offices for life, it meant that the king could not dismiss them. He could not force them to uphold the duties of their office. And through all of these measures, it is suggested and argued that the king was deprived of his judicial power. And yet, we have to look at this a little closely. The establishment of the Crown Tribunal in Lublin for Małopolska and in Piotrków Trybunalski for Wielkopolska was, in many respects, the culmination of the movement for the execution of the laws. Now, the movement for the execution of the laws was a noble movement, a movement of the ordinary Schlachter that sought to strengthen the authority of the king rather than diminish his authority and the concern of the execution movement was against those powerful nobles, those magnates, who had received alienated royal land, mortgages and leases on royal land that could not be reclaimed by the crown. And in 1504, this alienation of crown land was made illegal, and the execution movement throughout the century sought to uphold this law. They also sought ways of ensuring that judgments could be made in legal cases. There was an increasing tendency for cases from the local castle courts to be appealed not to the palatinate courts that heard appeals, but directly per saltem, jumping over these courts to the same court, that is, the king sitting in the same. Now, the king's own court, the Aulic court, had heard various cases traditionally, but it was felt that when the king sat in the same, the Judicium Regale Convencionale, this court had particular authority, and therefore appeals were made to the same court. But that court had a limited capacity to deal with appeals, because the same only met for short intervals. It was regulated to six weeks by law by the Henrician Articles two weeks for an extraordinary same. Even before this, by 1553, it was claimed that there was a backlog of 20,000 cases to be heard. Andrzej Fritsch modzewski claimed that the same court was 20 years in arrears in certain cases. The fiercest opposition to the tribunals came from the senators because they saw this as an attempt to circumvent the influence they had in the same court and to give the power of judgment in individual cases to elected judges. And so it was not the king, it was the senators who opposed the coming of the tribunals. Now, the tribunals were relatively effective, at least at first. They did clear a great deal of the backlog of these cases. But nevertheless, the same court in which the king sat remained important. In 
In Time Gone By, wrote an anonymous pamphleteer in 1573 during the first free election after the death of Sigismund August, in Time Gone By it was customary to seek justice at Sames. I still do not see that any one has found a procedure that can please everyone. In this matter our ancestors looked at two matters. Firstly, that I should not be judged by my equal, sine appellazione, without appeal, only by him who stands above me, whom I, as a free man, have chosen and recognise as my lord. Secondly, that I should not be judged out of the minds of men, but by the written law alone. So here we see that in a nobility that upheld a powerful egalitarian culture, that all nobles were equal, the need was felt for the possibility of appeal to a judge who was above the schlachter in that sense, the king who carried out his traditional function of supreme judge. The same court retained its position and retained its authority. As the Chamber of Envoys debated the king's agenda, the king sat in the Senate with his senators, hearing the appeals and cases that reached the same court. This is the famous judgment on the Arians in 1638, when the Arian school in, in Rakuf was condemned and eventually was closed down. The same court performed important functions, and it remained as an appellate court. Only the same court had ultimate jurisdiction in capital cases involving noblemen, except his causis mere criminalibus. Cases were frequently, if controversially, appealed from the tribunal to the same court, as in any legal system, losing plaintiffs frequently wanted to find a court that would accept an appeal if the verdict went against them. The grounds for that appeal were frequently that tribunals were seeking to create law without a statutory basis. And the residual power of the same court was demonstrated in the 1650s and 1660s, when under John Casimir, two successive government ministers, Hieronym Radziejowski in 1652 and Jerzy Sebastian Lubomirski in 1664, were successfully impeached in the same court. We have considerable problems, however, in researching how this system worked, and that is partly because of this. This is Ulitsa Dwuga in Warsaw in September 1944, at the end of the Warsaw Rising. Ulitsa Dwuga contains Agad, the central archive of old acts in Poland, which happened to be the headquarters of the northern group during the Warsaw Rising and the Germans took it, and some of the records, by no means all, but some of the records were burnt. 3,956 volumes of the records of the Crown Tribunal were burnt at the end of the Warsaw Rising. One book survives. It was misfiled in the Lublin Castle Court. And this is a serious problem. Some of these books ran to over 3,000 pages, which merely indicates that the Schlachter certainly had faith in their legal system. They were litigious and they believed in the court system and they sent their cases, their appeals, to the Crown Tribunal. The records of the Lithuanian Tribunal do survive, but not all of them. They were kept in Old Chancery Ruthenian until 1697, which is a rebarbative legal language. And in any case, the records of the early period of the Tribunal between 1581, when it was established, and 1655, were burnt during the Muscovite storm of Vilnius in 1655. And this was the period in which perhaps the tribunals were functioning best. In the Soviet period, there was little interest in the history of nobles, and therefore the records were difficult to access, and few scholars used them. We therefore have great difficulty in following cases through the local courts to the tribunal, because the records in the tribunal do, do not exist anymore. Some of the verdicts were copied into the local court books, but by no means all of them. And so we are in the dark. Frequently it seems that cases reach no conclusion, but that is because they were referred or appealed to the tribunal. So it is perhaps premature to judge the Polish-Lithuanian judicial system as dysfunctional. The establishment of the Lithuanian Tribunal in 1581 was part of a process that revealed the great appeal of republican justice and underlines its importance to the establishment of the Union itself. In 1562, 
the famous petition of the Lithuanian nobility gathered in the Pospolite Ruszenie asked for closer union with Poland. And this was precisely because ordinary Lithuanian noblemen wished to acquire the institutions of local self-government, local republican self-government that their Polish counterparts enjoyed, the local elected land courts and the local sejmiks. And these were established and introduced by the Second Lithuanian Statute in 1566, which set them up, the land courts and the castle courts, across the Grand Duchy. In Lithuania, the establishment of the tribunal in 1581 confirmed that the great lords, the great magnates who had dominated Lithuanian politics in the Jagiellonian period, were subject to the same law as ordinary nobles. This was the fundamental principle of the republic that was established across the Commonwealth in 1569. The Ruthenian Palatinates, the Palatinates of Bratslav, Volhynia and Kiev, that agreed their own treaties of union in 1569 with Poland, received a guarantee that their traditional law, Ruthenian law, would continue to operate in these Palatinates and indeed the Second Lithuanian Statute of 1566. A Ruthenian tribunal was established, it didn't last long, and cases from these Palatinates were later heard by the Małopolska Tribunal in Lublin. But even the Royal Prussians, who fiercely upheld their own Prussian law and were reluctant to join the common same set up in Lublin in 1569, nevertheless, even the Royal Prussians recognised the usefulness of the tribunals and they joined in the 1590s although they were careful to pass the new correction to Prussian law to ensure that it would be Prussian law that the tribunal judged. The key to the system was the control of the court system by elected judges. This was central to the idea of republican self-government, and it was an idea that appealed across the Union. Now, there is no doubt that violence was prevalent in Schlachter society, and I want to spend the rest of the lecture looking at how it was treated and thinking about how it was treated. A study by Marcin Kamler of two districts in the Palatinate of Sieradz in Wielkopolsk reveals that in 28 years that he looked at in the 17th century, there were 5,900 cases of wounding and 289 homicides in a mere two districts. Of these cases, 2,900 of the perpetrators of woundings were noble. That is 61% of the cases. The homicide figures were similar. And the cases reveal that nobles tended to wound and kill other nobles, and peasants attacked other peasants. Although, of course, there must have been many cases of nobles attacking peasants that never reached the court, so we can't reach too firm conclusions on that basis. In Bzesz Kujawski in 1610, 14 out of 16 cases of wounding, that is 88%, were by nobles on other nobles. So it seems that indeed there was a great deal of noble violence, although one has to be slightly cautious about the years that Kamler chooses. 1601 to 1610 were the years of the Sandomierz Rokosz, years in which political tension was ratcheted up to a high point. This is similarly true of the period of 1651 to 1660 during the Swedish deluge, when justice was hard to come by and the Schlachter were out fighting against the invaders of the Commonwealth. Nevertheless, it is a convincing picture of what Wojcicki claimed, and Opolinski claimed, and Gornitsky claimed. There was a great deal of violence around. And Seims and Seimiks often provided flashpoints. In 1593, at the Wutsk Seimik, Konstante Ostrogski, a great Ruthenian prince and one of the wealthiest magnates in the Commonwealth, was annoyed at poor nobles shouting down his supporters, and he called in his retinue. One nobleman was killed. In 1595, there was a brawl in Wisner Castle Court in Mazovia. Eleven were killed and no fewer than 61 were wounded. In 1635, at the Bratzwav Semik, there was a tumult and many, it is said, were injured. In 1641, blood was spilt at several Semiks. At the Wutsk Semik, Władysław Dominik Zaswavski Ostrogski, another great prince and magnet, had to take refuge in the sacristy, although order was eventually restored. And we could multiply these examples across the Commonwealth and across the period. So the nobles, the Schlachter, were hot-tempered and swords could easily be drawn. 
But a point that should be made is that this was a society with a higher degree of tolerance of noble on noble violence. Nobles were armed. This was an armed society. The wearing of a sword was a sign of nobility, it was a mark of nobility, and nobles, even the poorest of them, frequently paraded around in their swords. In the Ruthenian Palatinate, the Pospolita Ruschenia was still of military value, as it was in the Ukrainian Palatinate. It was frequently called out. You needed to have a rapid response force against Tartar raids that were so common in the southern and southeastern Palatinates. And at times of the Pospolita Ruschenia, tempers could flare, there was drinking, there was socialising, the Schlachter liked to drink, slights could be made, honour could be challenged and swords flashed out and when swords flash out wounding and sometimes death takes place so what was the response of the system to all of this how did the republican system cope with justice and here i'd like to look at the claims of michel foucault who has been so influential in developing thoughts about the development of justice systems in the modern period but of course, Foucault was talking about systems of state justice, systems that developed in Europe in the early modern period. Famously, he wrote about public executions. The public execution then has a juridico-political function. It is a ceremonial by which a momentarily injured sovereignty is reconstituted. Over and above the crime that has placed the sovereign in contempt, it deploys before all eyes an invincible force. Its aim is not so much to re-establish a balance as to bring into play the dissymmetry between the subject who has dared to violate the law and the all-powerful sovereign who displays his strength. So the punishment of offenders is part of the demonstration of power and sovereignty. His power is inscribed on the body of the unfortunate criminal. Now, many Polish historians have argued that it is a failure to establish this system of royal authority, of power in the Commonwealth, that helped bring about the failure of the state, and that explains the anarchy and violence that Wojcicki found in the archives. Yet Foucault's ideas do not really apply in the Commonwealth, in the Republic, which was a Republic. And in the last part of this lecture, I would like to look at the philosophy and the thinking and the culture of this Republican system of justice, which was very different from the system described here by Foucault. Let us look at how crime was conceptualised in this Republican system. Crimes were divided into two sorts. There were public crimes, les majestés, which were crimes against the king as the embodiment of the state and as the embodiment of the judicial system. And there were private crimes, perduelonis. These were crimes against the republic, against that community of citizens that formed the republic. The public crimes were fairly limited. There was treason, there was rebellion, there was peculation from the public purse, there was counterfeiting, there was violence in same samiks and courts. And this was treated quite seriously. Nobles who were convicted of drawing their swords in the presence of the king, of brawling during the same, of dueling during the same, could face the death penalty, and some of them were executed after being found guilty. Private crimes, however, were a different matter. Private crimes was effectively everything else, including homicide, including wounding. Here we have an illustration of a public crime, the arrest of Michal Piekarski for his assassination attempt on Sigismund III in 1620, and he was executed. Let us look at how homicide is treated in the law. In cases of homicide, the most important principle to establish was the question of intent. There was mens robust for umishlone, deliberate murder. Now, a noble who was found guilty of deliberate murder could be subject to the death penalty depending on the circumstances. There was mens robust for przygodne, accidental homicide, what in English law would be called manslaughter. This was not subject to the death penalty unless it was perpetrated by a non-noble against a noble. This is a society, therefore, which in many respects regards wounding an accidental death as collateral damage. It's part of what you expect to happen. 
in a society of noble citizens who are armed. Yet there were further subtleties in this. This is an illustration of the execution of Piekarski on the 27th of November 1620. Like the assassin of Henry IV in Paris in 1610, he was pulled apart by four horses. Now, a statute of 1611 sought to regulate which offences, civil and criminal, were to be judged by which courts. Most serious capital cases were reserved to the same court. But the division between public and private crimes was significant. There were problems. Intent was difficult to prove. It required noble witnesses, up to seven, and a perpetrator had to be caught in the act, in flagrante delicto. Now, this is a system in which torture was used in cities and towns under German law codes, Magdeburg law or Kulm law in Royal Prussia. It was not generally applied to the Schlachta. Now, torture in the rest of Europe was usually applied to elicit a confession. Once you had a confession, an admission of guilt, then you could apply the penalties that were prescribed for the offence. Without that confession, without that admission of guilt, it was hard to establish the intent that was regarded as essential for proving murder, the most serious capital crime of all. So let's look at those punishments. Wounding and homicide by sabres was almost always treated as non-intentional, and this is why those that perpetrated accidental homicide, manslaughter, were not executed for it on the whole. Until 1572, the penalty for deliberate murder committed by a noble on another noble was a fine of 120 marks compensation and a year and six weeks imprisonment in the lower dungeon of the tower of the castle court. Now, this has often been criticised, not least because the death penalty was applied to peasants, particularly peasants who murdered nobles. But we should not underestimate the effect of a year and six weeks in the lower dungeon of the castle court tower. This is the door to that tower in Kamienic Podolski. Above the door it says, Verus amicus rare est fenice. A true friend is rarer than the phoenix, and those who entered that lower dungeon might have felt similarly. The lower dungeon was below ground, it had no windows, it was dank, it was dismal. Moreover, in that lower dungeon, if you wished to be fed, you were dependent on your family and your friends, because the judicial starosta had no obligation to keep you alive. And there are cases in which people confined the lower dungeon, starved to death. Those guilty of lesser offences could be confined in the upper dungeon, which had windows and was in the tower itself. But certain kinds of death were treated more seriously. Deaths inflicted during a raid on a noble's property, or in particular in an ambush, were treated more seriously because there you could see some sort of intent. If you deliberately set out to raid a noble's property with an armed group, then you may well have an intention of at least inflicting wounds by a 1588 statute, the penalty for homicide was doubled, 240 marks for death inflicted by a pistol, and 480 marks for deaths inflicted by a musket or a bow. A pistol could be drawn in anger as much as a sabre, but a musket or a bow you have to aim from a distance, and this, it was felt, indicated some level of intent those found guilty, it was decreed, should not be allowed to avoid the public penalty, the poena publica, by paying more. A 1601 statute did introduce the death penalty and infamy, banishment, plus increased compensation payments for intentional murder, but that meant that these cases had to be decided on the whole in the same court. So how did republican justice function? The system that Foucault describes in many respects is the inquisitorial system of the Roman law codes that were widely applied across Europe. But the republican system of justice in Poland and Lithuania was an adversarial, not an inquisitorial system. There was a public prosecutor, the instigator, but his function was to investigate public crimes, not private crimes. Private crimes had to be prosecuted in most cases by those who were victims of them or their families. 
Plaintiffs and defendants, therefore, usually represented themselves. Magnates could and did employ professional lawyers, but ordinary nobles tended not to. They would register their complaints at the local castle court, and they would go down and say, this raid on my property happened, so-and-so was wounded, so-and-so was killed. And this was the way that cases began. And Natalia Starchenko, who has undertaken serious and wonderful research in the court books of the Volhynian Palatinate, suggests that these registrations meant that the castle court was a form of theatre. You were performing to local schlachter society. You were claiming that the behaviour of your neighbour or the person who had attacked you breached the norms of noble behaviour. And this is what the court was deciding on. Because crime was a collective issue, a crime dishonoured not just the perpetrator, but his family, and questioned the status and the honour, not just the personal honour of that man, but the honour of his whole family. And therefore the system was built on a notion of restorative, not retributive justice. There was frequently no final judgment in the cases. Both sides lodged their versions of events in the castle court, before the court, they performed their versions of what had happened. And frequently, this was part of a system in which the families got together and agreed compensation for what had taken place. Nevertheless, I would like to emphasize the importance of banishment or infamy as a punishment. It was a deliberate stripping of honor from anyone found guilty of this crime, and it meant that they no longer had the rights that were normally accorded to a noble citizen. They'd lost their political rights, they'd lost certain rights, such as protection under the law, such as the statute of Nem Neminem Captivabimus, for example. And it meant that the judgment of the court could be exercised against them, not necessarily by the judicial starosta, but by the family of the victim. And this was a way of getting round the issue of Neminem Captivabimus. If the criminal had absconded and could not be arrested, then having obtained a judgment, the family of the injured party could execute that judgment. And this is what lay behind many of the raids on Schlachter property. So, justice was dispensed by the Republic, not the King. The Republic had effectively deprived the King of responsibility for enforcing the law. There's a famous case in 1591 when the Krakow mob burned down the Calvinist church in Krakow. Sigismund III was at Varvel and was informed of it, and he continued the game of ball that he was playing. And Sigismund has frequently been criticised for not taking action. But Sigismund, who understood the system of republican justice, was aware that it was not up to him to enforce the law. It was up to the officials of the Republic, the starosta of Krakow. To enforce the law. He had no mechanisms at his disposal, the starosta did. That is why he continued his game. So enforcement was the responsibility of the officials of the Republic. The judicial starosta could enforce the verdict, although usually judicial starostas delegated their authority to a podstaroshti or a surrogator to carry out the judgments. And if they did not perform that function, there were complaints. Complaints were regular. 17% of the louder of the Chersk Semik between 1592 and 1647 concerned the functioning of the local courts and of the local officials who failed to uphold verdicts that were obtained in them. And the failure of these officials were what led to these private enforcements in which nobles rode out, they gathered their friends, they gathered their family in what might be called a posse, as functioned in the American Republic in the Wild West. Finally, let me return to the case of Stadnitsky, the devil of Weinsut. Was he the personification of the Schlachter estate, as Wojinski claimed? Was he an anomaly? This is what Wojinski said about him. Stadnitsky broke the law, yet constantly ran to the law. He trod underfoot all principles of morality, yet constantly spoke of virtue. He perpetrated violent and bloody acts, yet played the role of victim. And Wojcinski clearly was perplexed by this. How could a man who spoke so much of virtue, how could a man who went regularly to the law be so much in contempt of that law? Well, Stadnitsky was certainly a violent and intemperate man, but in many respects he was a personification of 
the Republican system of justice. Let us look a little at his career. He had a distinguished military record. He fought in Batori's wars against Muscovy, where he distinguished himself. He was a Republican activist. He was popular among the local Schlachter. He was a leading figure in the Sandomish Rokosh, where he intemperately lashed out at Sigismund III, accusing him of sodomy and various other heinous crimes, for which eventually he had to apologise in person to Sigismund. His apology was a little mealy-mouthed, it has to be said. He fell into dispute with many families, but in particular with the Korniak family, over a debt on the property of Weinsut. Stadnitsky had bought Weinsut from the Piletsky family, and the debt was that of the Piletskys, but it was secured on the Weinsut property. Stadnitsky simply refused to pay it, and he pursued the Korniaks through the courts, and the Korniaks pursued him through the courts. He challenged their noble status. They were recently ennobled merchants of Greek origin, and he would go to law, as he did against many of his contemporaries. He was performing in that theatre of which Starchenko talks. He was very careful to get his retaliation in first, to give his version of events to the court. But he fell foul of the law himself. In 1605, his egregious breaches of the law led to the tribunal issuing a decree of banishment. So he was stripped, in effect, of his rights as a noble. This was not the first time. He'd been banished in 1588 over his support of Archduke Maximilian Habsburg during the 1587 election, although that banishment was collectively lifted in due course. And this is why he lost his dispute with Opolinsky. Opolinsky was a man of status. He was the son of Andrzej Opolinsky, formerly Crown Grand Marshal, and he came from this powerful magnate family in Wielkopolska. So when, with a property bordering on Stadnitsky's property, he fell into dispute with Stadnitsky, he did not take it lying down. Stadnitsky usually mounted raids on the property of other nobles by enlisting Hungarian mercenaries that he had met during his service in Batori's wars, and who served him not because they were part of any private army, but because they could obtain booty and loot from Stadnitsky's raids. Stadnitsky could not afford to maintain a private army. Precious few nobles could. The private armies are a myth. What they could do was call out their friends, their associates, their retainers in these posses that mounted raids. Opolinsky knew that this was what Stadnitsky did, so he brought up a posse of his own and marched on Stadnitsky's property. Stadnitsky was caught off guard. He rallied his Hungarian supporters. But in the ensuing skirmish, he was killed. And it is worth noting that Opolinsky suffered no detriment because of this. He registered his version of events at the castle court, and he claimed that all he was doing was upholding and defending his own life and the safety of the Republic. Now, Opolinsky was already a judicial starosta. He was therefore one of the Republic's officials. What he was doing was upholding the sentence against Stadnitsky, a man who had been declared to be infamous and stripped of his rights. I do not seek renown, said Opolinsky, or any personal triumph on account of this death. I was never and am not thirsty for the blood of men. What happened, like it or not, I was obliged to undertake, and I do not know whether or not I should be summoned before the highest tribu tribunal. I will only say that God summoned my adversary before me and inflicted on him the fate he had planned for me. And there was no criticism of Opolinsky for what he had done. This was how Republican justice was enacted. He had not breached the norms of Schlachta society. As Jan Zamoyski, as starosta of Krakow, had breached those norms when he arrested and hastily executed Samuel Zborowski, member of the Zborowski clan and a political rival of Zamoyski's in the Krakow Palatinate. Samuel Zborowski had killed a nobleman, Vapovsky, in 1573 in Varvel, in the, when the king was living in the castle. This was a public crime. He'd been found guilty. But Henry of Valois, in judging the case, 
had not imposed a death penalty, he had exiled Samuel Zborowski, but had not stripped him of honour. So when he was arrested by Zamoyski and executed, this was felt to be in breach of the norms of noble society. And when Zborowski's brother Krzysztof was arraigned before the same court, there was, an out, there was outrage. The Zborowskis paraded Samuel's body in an open coffin round the Kraków Sejmik at Proszowice, and Zamoyski came under serious criticism at the same. He had to stand down as Starosta of Kraków. He had breached those norms. What Opolinski had done, not a problem. What Zamoyski did was a problem. I would like to make clear what I am not doing here. I am not claiming that this republican system of justice was an efficient system of justice that held criminals to account for murder, for wounding, for their crimes. It was not. But we have to judge this system on its own terms and according to its own culture, its own legal principles. And I'd like to end by quoting Natalia Starchenko, whose marvellous book, Strategies and Rituals of Conflict, looks at this culture this noble culture in the Volhynian Palatinate in the 16th and the 17th centuries. And she suggests that one has to understand the context in which the dramatic description of heinous crimes, which Wojcicki eagerly and uncritically transferred to his magnificently lurid pages, give no more of an idea of reality than television dramas or the films of Quentin Tarantino. This was a system that functioned according to its own norms and its own culture. We may not admire that culture, but we should take it into account when we try to explain and understand the Commonwealth of Poland, Lithuania and its legal system. Lex was indeed Rex, but how that Lex was applied was very different to the rest of Europe in this period.